but how can I not? You see what I'm saying? How can I not? I owe it to everybody to preach on it. I read a survey the other day that stated that less than six of ten Americans believe in hell. Now think about that for a second. Less than six of ten Americans believe in hell. Think about that, guys. That's horrible. That's horrible. Because here's the deal. If you don't believe in hell, then why do you need a Savior? You see how Satan works? You see how he works? You see how he works? And the title of our message today is A Glimpse of Hell. And the reason I'm preaching on this, guys, is if Satan can convince you that you don't, hell doesn't exist and you don't need him, then you're not going to want to get saved. You want to get saved. Let us pray. Gracious Lord in heaven, we love you and we praise you. We hallow your name. Father God, I thank you for this word. I pray that the congregation today gets a word from, from you and not from me. God, I just pray that you forgive the pastor today because my sins are so many. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, before we dive into the text, which we're going to do, I want to do a deep dive right quick on something that happened 22 years ago. On May 26, 2002, you guys might remember this, but you know the, the, the bridge on I-40 uh, over between Salisaw and uh, Weber's Falls, it collapsed. It collapsed at Weber's Falls, Oklahoma. I mean, a barge hit this big, the, 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 the bridge, and Tammy and I, and, and if you lived in Oklahoma, any part of your life, you've gone over this bridge. And when we lived in eastern Oklahoma, we used to go through it all the time. But a barge hit this bridge, and basically this bridge collapsed. Okay. Now here's what I want you to understand. Uh, the, the bridge, um, uh, without warning, without warning, multiple drivers and cars started flying. This thing's big. It's like a mountain. Okay. So when you, when you go up, you're falling you know, 300 or 400, 500 feet. So all of a sudden, all these cars were going, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles an hour down the highway, and they just start dropping off. They start dropping off. They start dropping. Finally, finally, you know, a bus uh, sees what's happening. A bus pulls out and, and, and blocks off the road and starts warning people, okay? So no more of it happened. But I'm going to ask you guys something. I'm going to ask you guys something. So imagine my hometown. My hometown was Salisaw, Oklahoma. It's right there on I-40. Now, it's approximately 27 miles from Salisaw to that bridge where the bridge collapsed. Now, I want you to imagine something. I want to ask anybody in this room. There were 14 people killed, to include a captain from Fort Sill. And I'm going to ask you something. Starting in Salisaw, Oklahoma, 27 miles from where this bridge collapsed, do you think if we had a warning sign, multiple warning signs, from, from Salisaw to Weber's Falls, do you think any of those people would have plunged to their death? Bridge is out. Bridge is out. Let me ask you something even more. Do you think if we had 245 warning signs that this bridge was out, do you think we would have 14 cars drive off of it? Probably wouldn't, right? Now think about this for a second. I want you to just work with me here, okay? So there's 39 books in the Old Testament, right? There's 27 books in the New Testament, 27 miles from Salisaw to the bridge, 27 books in the New Testament. Now think about this. There's 179,000 words in the New Testament. There's, there's there's um, 7,959 verses, and there's 260 chapters in this New Testament. Now, here's what I want you guys to understand. In the Old Testament, Jesus Christ was concealed, but in the New Testament, he's revealed, right? Okay, so think about this for a second. Okay, so think about this for a second. Now, in this New Testament that was inspired by God, there are approximately 245 warning signs of judgment and hell. In this New Testament, 245 warning signs. And there's not, not, there's not one subject in the New Testament that's more repetitive than the coming judgment of God. In fact, Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven. And he describes it more intensely. 
Now, let me just say this. If you have that many warnings about a coming judgment of hell, and hell is coming, and hell is real, why are there so many people ignoring it? Because here's the deal. If anybody in this room right now, or any of your relatives, or any of your friends, or any of your family, if you knew, for example, if you knew that they were on that road between Salisaw and Weber's Falls, and you knew that bridge was out, but, but you wouldn't want to tell them, right? You would. Think about it. Now, this is what we're going to pick up in the text that Robert so eloquently read for us today. Remember, yep, verse 19. Okay, first verse here. Now, it's a little bit different translation on the screen. I'm going to read from the New Testament. Or, I'm sorry, the New King James Version. This is the Old King James Version. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Now, here's the thing, guys. The, the color purple in the Bible is a sign of a whole lot of wealth. You're very rich. You're, very, you're rich and famous. And, and he would have been this, this, this rich man that, that Robert talked about in the Bible. This dude, uh, he, was like, uh, he was like Elon Musk rich, okay? I mean, he was like really Elon Musk rich. You know, Elon Musk, uh, he bought Twitter for $42 billion. That's just a chump change to him. I'm just going to buy Twitter for $42 billion. This guy, uh, he was eating a, he was eating a caviar, uh, clam on the half, sh uh, half shell. He could have Taco Bell, Popeyes, David's favorite, McDonald's. Uh, he could have that every day, okay? Uh, this guy wasn't snacking on Slim Jims and Diet Coke. Let me, just let me say that, all right? This dude was eating good. He was eating real good. He was eating the uh, all-you-can-eat buffets, man. He was flamboyant. But let's go to verse 20, Matty. Let's go to verse 20 here. But notice what he says here. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who laid on his gate. This translation here was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at the gate, full of sores. No, it's okay. So picture this. Outside the, uh, the rich guy's house, there was this, there was this poor, nasty uh, little man uh, that, that, that had a bunch of sores on him. He was old. Uh, he was poor as a church mouse. He didn't have a pot to pee in. He was, uh, he was, he was had all these nasty sores on his body. He probably smelled bad. Um, um, and um, he just didn't have anything. Now think about this for a second. And I want you to understand this. This story is not about how poor people go to heaven and rich people go to hell because it has nothing to do with it. Okay? All right, so understand this up front. Uh, um, you're going to see this gospel story. The poor man, what you're going to see in Scripture today, the poor man is going to go to heaven because he's a believer. All right? He, had, he, 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 he heeded to the warning sign. The rich man is going to go to hell because he was not saved. He was not a believer. But notice, let's go to verse 22. Desiring... And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. Now, okay, so, so the poor guy, he's out there in front of the rich guy's house. They're, they're leavening, you know, when you, you go out and you give your dog scraps, you know. Jim and Audrey do that to my dogs all the time, I'm just saying. That's why they're always hanging out at their house, okay. But here's the deal. This is what he was getting. He was eating the scraps, but notice this, uh, notice this, the dogs licked his sore. So, you know, the, there's, there's some old wise tale that uh, uh, if a dog licks your sore, it has like medicine value, medicinal value, right? And let's see what the Bible says about this, or this medicinal value, okay? If it's really, it has healing properties, okay? So you guys think it has healing properties? Huh? Anybody? No? Huh? Let's see what the Bible says. Let's go to verse 22, please. And it came to pass that the beggar died. No, nope, he, he didn't have any healing properties, right? All right? So here's the deal. Here's the deal. It probably does, but I'm just playing with you here. So think about this for a second. So, so the beggar died, okay? It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels, okay, into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now think about this for a second, okay? So this poor guy that smells... Okay, um, he has all these sores on him. He dies. Now, here's what's fascinating about this story. Uh, here's what I don't want you guys to forget here. Jesus is telling this story. 
It's Jesus telling this story. It's not just some old guy in the Bible telling this. This is Jesus telling this story. So think about this for a second. Think about this for a second. Jesus is telling this story. And this nasty loser, ugly, poor, he stinks, he has sores, and he's carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, what is this? What's Abraham's bosom? What does it mean? It means the angels of God carried him to Abraham's chest. And they say that the chest is close to your what? Your heart. All right, so think about that for a second. Another contrast to the worldly domain and God's domain. Now, here's the thing. Look what it says here. The rich man also died and was buried. Okay, so I'm sure that the rich man had an elaborate funeral. I'm sure that, that Elton John probably wrote a song about him. You know, um, they had all these celebrities come and give speeches. It was probably on TV. Everybody's watching it. Okay, but let's go to verse 23. It's 23. Now, the rich man died, okay, and being in torment... Everybody shout, Hades with me. Hades. Now everybody shout, Hell with me. Hell. Right there. Hades in the New, the New King James Version translation, hate at Hell in the Old Testament, or the, the Old King James Version. Okay? Think about this for a second. I want you to think about this. He lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off, and he saw Lazarus in his bosom. Think about this for a second. John Doon, he was a pastor, and he said, he had a quote one time, and he said, death is a great equalizer. And here's the thing, guys, I don't care if you're, you're Donald Trump or Donald Duck, you're still going to die. You are. You're, you're still going to die. I mean, everybody's going to die. That's true. It's a great equalizer. You're still going to die. Jesus didn't say, you know, uh, now, this is where it gets into here. This is where it's really important that a pastor has the, the courage to go talk about hell. So let's go here, here to verse 24. Look here what it says in verse 24. Notice what he says here. And he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Let's stop for a second. Let's put the Jake brakes on here just for a second. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now think about this. Notice this. The rich man was probably religious at some point in his life, maybe, but he would, didn't have a relationship with God. He didn't believe in God. He might have been religious on the outside, but now he's realizing he's in hell forever, and he's starting to pray. Here's something that, 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 here's a fact, guys, that I'm just going to tell you. Once you're in hell, you can't pray for your salvation. It doesn't work. It won't work. And that's, 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 that, that's a cold, hard reality. And you can no longer pray for your salvation once you get to hell. Uh, and here's the other fascinating thing. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there's the only thing that you can't do in heaven, you're going to be able to do everything you want to in heaven. There's going to be so much fun in heaven. But the one thing that you can't do in heaven is share the gospel with somebody. Can I get an amen? You can't, you can't help get somebody to heaven, right? You can't help get somebody to heaven. And that's what's so sad. Okay, that's what's so sad here. You can no longer pray for your salvation, but you can't help. But notice how he, he called him Father Abraham. He didn't call him Abe. He didn't call him uh, Mr. Abraham. So he must have known something about religion. Okay? But also notice here. You see this in your text here. On the tip, you know, the tip, may he dip the tip of his finger in water. What was the change from that? Remember what he was eating? Man, he was eating caviar. He was drinking the finest wines. He, was, he had all that stuff, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the poor guy didn't have anything. But I, here's, here's, here's a simple drop of water. Just a simple drop of water. How many times do we just take for granted that pure, delicious water that we drink? We take it for granted because I'll tell you, if you don't have it, that's a blessing from God. We don't think about that many times. But think about this. Think about this. What is you're seeing here? Is you're seeing from the rich man? He is separated from the presence of God. Guys, here's what's going to happen to the unbelievers. 
the presence, being separated from God's presence is going to be horrific. And we talked about this, I think, a while back. We talked about it in our Bible study at one point. Being separated from God's presence is horrific. It's horrible. You just don't realize how many God's pleasures you're getting blessed with. But let's go to verse 25, Maddie. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things. And likewise, Lazarus. But Abraham, I'll, I'll read it in the New King James Version, or King James. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in the lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. That word again, tormented. Warning sign, right? Warning sign. Let me ask you guys something. Have you ever thought about your retirement savings for the older guys? Your, where's your retirement savings? Is it in God's domain or is it man's world? Because I'm going to tell you guys, have you ever seen that meme on uh, Facebook where, where a, a hearse is pulling a U-Haul trailer? Imagine that. Can't. Everything you have here on this earth, you can't take with you. The only thing that you can deposit in God's kingdom are things that are in God's domain. That's why we're studying the book of James. It's faith in action. What are you doing? What are you doing to expand God's kingdom? What are you doing to, to put deposits in your, in your heavenly bank account? What are you doing? And I'm not necessarily talking about money. If you're blessed with money, of course. Yeah, that's something how, but I'm talking about time. You know, in, in uh, Matthew 6, I talk about it all the time. Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all will be given to you, and all his righteousness. Some pastors will say that's about money, and yeah, it's, it could be about tithing, but I'm going to tell you something, guys. Jesus wants a whole lot more than your money. Amen? He wants everything. He wants to be first in everything. Everything. If, if you're going to plan a trip to, I don't know, to a football game. Let, let's, pray, let's pray about it. If, if you're going to do a vacation, if you're going to, if you have a, 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 I know David right now is going through a, a decision he's making whether to play basketball or wrestle. And uh, he, he likes both sports. Okay? And something he's been praying on. You, you see what I mean? I have things that I'm praying on. It, 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 you know, right now, Tammy and I have things that we're praying on. I know baby Mary has things that she's praying on. I know Colton does too. Everybody has something that you're praying. That's what Jesus wants to be first in. Don't forget that. But notice here. Notice here. Let's go to verse 26 here, Maddie. And besides all this, between us, you are there, is a great gulf fixed. Now, let's stop here for a second. You're probably like wondering, what is that? What, what is that great gulf fixed? Okay. It's like a, it's like a, here, here's, here's what it is, guys. There's no way, it's like a great wall that you can't penetrate. And once you, you, once you jump into that, that other domain, two seconds after you die, you can't go back. It, no matter how hard you try, you can't go back. Once you step on the other side of the chasm, okay, you can't do it. You can't do it. That great gulf of fixed, as you see there, that they which would pass from, hence you cannot... Uh, you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from them. Remember this. Jesus is telling this parable. Jesus is God. Hell is real. And once you've arrived, you can never leave. <coughs> kind of like that old Eagle song. Some of us old enough to remember that. I know you are, Don Nelly and Steve Rowland. You could check out, but you can never leave, right? You could check out, but you can never... Burl probably remembers that old Eagle song. You can check out, but you can never leave. Let's go to verse 27. Then he said to them, look here, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. Okay, st stop there for a second. So now the rich man is worried about his family. He, he's, he's worried sick about his family because he loves his family. He, he doesn't want his family to go to hell. So he said, send, send Lazarus. Just send Lazarus and tell him about this place. Think about that for a second. Send Lazarus. 
Let's go to verse 28, Maddie. For I have five brethren. See that? I have five brothers. That he's, they may testify. Everybody say testify with me. Testify. Our testimony. This is where it's so important that we share the gospel with people. We witness to people. We say yes. We witness to people. That's what our testimony is. Every single one of you have a testimony in this room. Guard it with your life. Guard your testimony with your life. It's so important that they least also come into this place of torment. He's so worried about his family. He doesn't want them to be there. And he wants them to testify. It makes sense, right? Lazarus, just come back up to the earth and testify. Let's go to verse 29. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, there's a whole bunch of testimony in this book right here, guys. There's a whole bunch of testimony in here. A whole bunch of testimony. There's a whole bunch of warning signs. Just read it and believe it. That's all you got to do. And that's what's so sad. The rich man, he's worried, sick about his family. But here's the deal. Imagine that you and your family are driving down I-40. And you know that your family is driving down I-40. And that bridge is out. And you know it. You're doing everything you can to get a hold of your family, right? Call them. He's pleading from hell. Go do a testimony. Remember, the only thing you can't do in heaven is share the gospel. But let's go to verse 29, Maddie. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, not one went to them from the dead. They will repent. You see what Abraham's telling him during this time? They didn't have the New Testament, but they had the Old Testament. They had the prophets. And he's saying, hey, he's saying, hey, they have pastors, they have churches, they have, they have, they have the, the word. And here's what I want you guys to understand. That's very, very important. Hell is not a hospital for the sick. You guys are sitting in the hospital for the sick. Can I get a witness? This is where we're supposed to be when we're sick. This is where we get well. This is where we get well. Your church. No, hell is a permanent prison for the condemned. But notice here in verse 30. Let's go to verse 30 there, Matty. And he said unto him, If they hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though they once rose from the dead. Think about that. So Jesus is telling him, said, it doesn't matter. They're going to they're gonna hear from them, but they're not going to believe it. You know what's fascinating, guys? Every prophecy in the Old Testament, if you do the math and you do the research and you look at every prophecy about Jesus in the Old Testament, every single one of them came true. Some of them, 2,000, 1,500, 1,000 years. Now, let me just ask you guys this. If all those prophecies, if, he had, if you have a 100% record of being right from the Old Testament to the New Testament, what do you think the New Testament's record is going to be? It's going to be 100%, right? It's going to be 100%. But notice here in verse 31. Let's go to verse 31. But he said to him, and he said to, unto him, If they hear Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded. It's not enough for God to take us out of hell. He must take hell out of us. And that's what he does. Some people may see a problem with using hell as coercing people. I don't look at it as coercing. I look at it as warning people because I love them. I, I, we don't want anybody to go to hell. You're probably thinking, well, so you're telling me, Pastor, we have a God that says, serve me or else. That kind of seems kind of schemy, preacher. Serve me or else. You're, you're telling me we have a God that, 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 that really says, serve me or else. Are you telling me that? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Can I get a witness? <laughs> he created us. I mean, he gets to make the rules. We don't get to make the rules. Serve me or else. It's true. 
but he gives us the free will to choose. And as we close today, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about this. Understand this. God doesn't send anybody to hell. He doesn't. We send ourselves for refusing to heed his call. He gives us multiple warning signs from Matthew to Revelation. There are so many in here, guys. So many. God gives us multiple ones. And what happens many times? We hear this, keep those Bible-thumping Jesus freaks out of this. Now what happens is you, you keep telling God, no, just leave me alone. Uh, someday I'll get right with you, God, but not today. Someday, yeah, someday I'm going to get right with you, God, but not today. Uh, God, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. You know what God does? You keep telling him no. He'll eventually say, okay, I'll leave you alone. And then you're going to be on that other side of that chasm. With every head bowed and all eyes closed. Father God, if there's somebody here today that has never said yes to you, we're going to do an invitation here in a second. And if you have never, if you've doubted in your mind that you have never publicly and officially received Christ into your heart, let today be that day. And you say, well, how do I do that, Pastor? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. We pray. We say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. No, I, I, I'm not good enough to get into heaven. Not one person on earth is good enough to get into heaven. We are all sinners. We've all done wrong. We've all sinned. But God, I just I want to make you first in my life. I want you to be my king. I want to serve you. So you admit you're a sinner. And then you say, Father, I believe that you are indeed God. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that, that you died on the cross for our sins. And I also believe that you are resurrected on that third day. And the last thing is the C, A, B, C, admit, believe, and C, commit to him forever. Say, God, I want to be in your kingdom forever. Because 900 trillion years from now, I want to be in that mansion that you built for me. And I want to be that guy here on earth where the light or gal, where the light of Jesus is shining. And, and if you've never prayed that prayer, I'm going to give you a chance to come up here and pray with me. And I'm going to pray that prayer for you. And you can accept Jesus Christ right now, right here. And he can be your Lord and Savior forever. When we do this invitation, when we sing Just As I Am, just here in a few minutes. So if you've never done that before, I'm going to give you a chance. Don't be embarrassed about it. Nobody's, is this just family right in here? I want to pray that prayer of salvation with you. And I want you then to get baptized into his grace. Father God, I thank you and I praise you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Please stand.